Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are going to look at the the one thing. This phrase is mentioned uh, many times in the Bible, but to really understand this one thing ties in what we talked about yesterday when it came to faithfulness and perseverance. Because perseverance, the, the definition of perseverance is to persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And as we talked about the parable of the fig tree and the parable of the faithful and wicked servant, we saw that the connection piece was as in the days of Noah, that the aspect of walking out purpose and preaching righteousness is what God expects believers to do in the delay. And that our heart position in the delay is what allows us to stay faithful in the process. But over and over in the Bible, Old and New Testament, you have people pointing out this one thing. And this phrase is so important. So we're going to look at this today. So let me pray. and We're going to get right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless this word in Jesus name. Let the spiritual seed sown be sown in our hearts, producing in our bodies, our mind, our will and our emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us into the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to start in Philippians 3. And we're going to read first what Paul said. Now, I think it's important to remember who the Apostle Paul is, that Paul was first Saul, who persecuted the church, who who killed Christians, who was a, against what God was doing in the earth in his time until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. An encounter with God changed his entire life and set him on a course to focus on one thing. So in Philippians 3, it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. He's saying it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. It's, it's not a burden to have to tell you because it's, it's for you. It's for your safe. It's to, it's to build you up. He says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of conscience or concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now here's, here's we're going to get into this next phrase, these next couple of verses. is going to explain Paul's heart position and his focus in his walk with God. And these are two very important keys if you are going to stay faithful, because Paul said, I have whereof where I could glory. I was a Hebrew. I am, I, I am, technically, I am a Pharisee. Like I knew the law. I was touching the law blameless. I had every bit in the natural and in the flesh whereof I could boast. If you say you didn't sin, I, I not only, not only did I not sin, but I was at the greater degree. Now, Paul, obviously we all sin, but when it comes to offering sacrifices, when he says it's touching the law blameless, that, that means walking according to the law of God. It's not saying without sin, but it's saying blameless in it when you sin, fulfilling the sacrifices. That I didn't walk like a heathen. I walked in the fear of God. But the way in which I understood it was wrong because I didn't see Jesus over and over in the gospel says, any man that had ears to hear, let him hear. Because the people were blinded the, the, the heart callous, the shackles on the eyes, not being able to perceive God in the flesh who was standing before them. 
And when Paul had this encounter with God, it opened his eyes to the revelation that my own works, my own things in the flesh, I count but dung because I'm I'm going after the excellency of Christ Jesus. But he says this in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, talking about the resurrection of the dead, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Now, Paul's saying that what I'm telling you, I have not yet received. I hadn't made it. I'm not perfect yet. I haven't got the prize yet. I'm just on the journey. This is important to note that when you read through the word, people always pull examples. And they say, well, what about this man? Or what about this man? Or what about Paul? And they use examples and they want to talk about healing comparative to Paul. Or they want to talk about financial provision as compared to Paul. Or somebody like that. Or, or any of these other examples. When the Bible doesn't tell you to be conformed into the image of Paul. It says be conformed into the image of Christ. You're growing up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not Paul. And that's what Paul is saying here. I'm not there yet. The standard is Christ. The goal is him. He is the standard. I'm just on the journey with all of us. But this phrase in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's saying this one thing, my focus, what is keeping me steadfast, is keeping me faithful. It's allowing me to persevere unto the end. Paul said, I ran my race. I finished my course. Like I, I did what I was supposed to. I stayed faithful all the way into the end. That takes perseverance. That the difficult, the delay, I'm not stopping. I'm not quitting. Dr. Summer I'll always just say, the only losers are the ones who quit, so don't quit. Paul said, I didn't quit. But the reason in which he persevered, the reason why he persevered, he said, there's one thing. There's one thing on my mind. It's the high, it's the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's that God has called me and ordained me. He put purpose in my life to walk out. And this one thing I do is focus on him and go after fulfilling his purpose in my life. He said, I forget the former. I press forward. I don't look back. I don't stop. I don't quit. I just move forward after God. It's the one thing I do. Now, this phrase is so important that if you look back in the Psalms, in Psalms 27, the great psalmist, King David, King David was, it said he was a man after God's own heart. He loved God. David truly loved God. Now, David, as, as Paul, had shortcomings. You know, God doesn't, God doesn't pick perfect people. God uses, God uses people who are willing to say yes. It's not that God uses broken people because he doesn't use perfect people. He uses people that say yes. People that are willing to go after him, willing to serve alongside of him, willing to be a vessel to God. It says in the Gospel of Luke, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the master's use. But it also says that you can make yourself a vessel unto honor. And the way in which you do that is accepting and and, and surrendering your will, as Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, and letting God's will flow through your life. It's pressing, it's that one thing. Forgetting the past, pushing forward, going after the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. That high calling, that, that God ordained purpose is the eternal counsel of the Godhead in your life fulfilled as you accept and follow the call. David said in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, 
came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should arise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to, and to inquire in his temple. I, I, I love this verse. We just keep going for a second. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore, will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry my voice and have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. My heart is to God. My focus is the one thing is to see the face of God, to seek after him, to be in relationship with him, to attain the mark of the high calling of God, to, to be in relationship, walking out purpose with God. It's the one thing. The Song of Solomon is an eight chapter love song. It's, it's, it's the progression of maturity in a believer's life. And I didn't have this in my notes, but I, I, I guess we'll read this verse real quick. It's Song of Solomon 7. In verse 10, she says, I am my beloved's and is desirous towards me. But then there's a phrase she repeats four times in the next couple of verses. She says, come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourishes, whether the tender grapes appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. The mandrakes give a smell and at our gates are all manner of pleasant for his new and old, which I have laid it for thee, O my beloved. If you want more teaching on that, go back and watch our teaching on our verse by verse through the Song of Solomon. But this phrase, let us, let us, let us, repeating it over and over and over. Because earlier through the song, she would say, I'm going, or you go. It's, uh, yeah, God, you go do your thing while I do mine. Or I'm going to go walk out my purpose, but I'm still not walking it out with you. Yes, I love you, but I'm not doing it completely connected. But as a full, mature believer, never walks out purpose outside of God. It's not that just I seek God's face. But there is purpose in my life that I will seek him to do life with him. It's the one thing I desire. It's not religion. It's not rules. It's not servitude. It's relationship with the almighty God. The Genesis one God, the, the, the bridegroom, king and judge. The one that loves you, not only loves you, but likes you. Not only likes you, but has desire for you. That actually wants relationship with you. You must know this. This is this is the one thing. I mean, David, a man after God's own heart. The Bible says that David did all the will of God. Well, he, he did all the will of God, but he made a lot of mistakes. Then how did he do the will of God? It's the lens in which God sees our life based on our heart position to be in relationship with him. It's the grace of God that gives you a blank slate, allows you to start over. It's what washes you clean. Psalm 27, it talks about mercy. Mercy is the, 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 God is love. And love always is compelled to act in love. And mercy is the act of God's love. To pardon iniquity. To reconcile to himself. To offer himself a sacrifice to reconcile back to himself. To make provision available before the need. I mean, you see, you see David, a man after God's own heart, and then Paul, who was first Saul, who was killing Christians, having the same focus. My one thing, I desire to see God. I desire to obtain eternal relationship with him. It's what I desire to the degree. It's my main focus, and it's what is allowing me. It's what's keeping me faithful.
It's a, what's allowing me to persevere through the struggle and the delay is that I'm looking at it. I mean, David's surrounded. He's encamped. He's got people coming against him. I mean, Paul is persecuted and put in prison and stoned and whipped, but faithful and persevered through it all because their focus was this one thing. I want to give you two truths that deal with this one thing that that should help you stay faithful through the process. I want to go to the book of Joshua. Joshua 23. Joshua 23, and I'm just going to read this one verse. This is when Joshua is turning over. Joshua is about to go and be with the Lord. He's given a couple last-minute dissertations before he passes away in the children of Israel. And we go into the book of Judges, and you can read through Judges. It was a fun book to read. But he makes this important statement. He said, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And know ye in all your hearts... And in all your souls, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. He said the one thing, not one thing hath failed. Everything God promised, God made come to pass. Paul said, I'm not there yet, but God has never failed. God never failed. There's it, it, Joshua turning the children of Israel over before going to heaven. The man who led Israel into the promised land said not one thing failed. Everything God promised came to pass. Now, if you read all the other verses around it, it also is about to talk about the fact that you're going to turn away from God and God's judgment is coming also. He's a righteous judge. He judges righteously. But this, this understanding that not one thing has ever failed. What God has, his eternal counsel, his plan will come to pass in your life. If like David, like Paul, you're focused on him and your relationship with him, he will cause it to come to pass. Not one thing, not one good thing failed. Everything God promised came to pass. And I want to finish. I want to look at Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3 is a prophetic passage dealing with the, the generation that the Lord returns in the second coming of the Messiah, the second coming of Jesus. Verse 1, he said, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I'm stirring you up to remember. Don't forget that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So don't forget the prophets. Don't forget that there's prophetic words God has spoken about your salvation, about your healing, about your deliverance, about your prosperity, about his coming and redemption and vindication in your life. He's a righteous judge. And when he pronounces innocence, it is coming with vindication. He's a king with power and authority. He's a bridegroom with desire. He will vindicate you in the sight of all men. The cry of how long from the martyrs which stand before the throne of God, crying out how long in the book of Revelation, will pour out the wrath of God against, against the evil of the world. It will not go unpunished. All through the Bible, God says their blood will be avenged. All the way to the back, the first murder in the Bible. I mean, this, this, the, the blood will be avenged. When Cain killed Abel, God said that blood cries out to me. Peter's saying, don't forget these prophetic words. They're so important. They're so important. Why? Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly, willingly are ignorant of 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being, that was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, I love but, if you ever want to, when you, when you see the word but, you need to know what it's there for. Because but's a big indication. It says, but, beloved. He's saying, I love you. Church, I'm telling you, I love you. You need to understand what's about to be said. Be not ignorant. Don't be unlearned. Be not ignorant. You ready? Be not ignorant of this one thing. Don't be ignorant of this. Peter's saying, I love you. So you need to not, like, don't be unlearned concerning this one thing. I love you so much. I'm stressing the point that I, I love you. Make sure you understand this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the electments shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Peter says, don't be ignorant. Don't be unlearned. Study this one thing. The reason why he said there is one thing that you must know that's going to keep you faithful. The, the same thing that, 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 that David knew, that Paul knew. There's like, I'm focusing on my relationship, my intimacy with God, walking out my purpose with God. There's one thing, it's, it's relationship with him. I'm not doing it without him. I'm focusing on my relationship with him. I'm staying faithful. If you watch our teaching yesterday, it's the wicked servant that says, my master delayeth, so I will go and do what I want. In an hour as you think not, the son of man cometh. How do you stay faithful? And we talked about this yesterday. It's walking out purpose. It's as the days of Noah. Paul said, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm pushing forward. It's the mark of the high calling of God. It's that I have purpose. I'm walking out. David said, I'm, I'm staying faithful. It's the one thing I desire to see God's face. It's so important that you understand that a day with the Lord is as a thousand and a thousand years is one day, which allows us to understand that the way in which we value how quick promises come to pass in our life, how quick we obtain the things that God has promised us. How do we stay faithful in the process? How do we persevere until we see God's promises come to pass in our life? Is to understand that God's time frame isn't ours. So if we understand that God moves on his time frame, you might say it's been five years. In God's eyes, it could have been just a second. But the promise is that you, if you are faithful and you do persevere, what did Joshua say? Not one thing that God promised you failed ever. If we focus on the one thing, our relationship with God and walking out our purpose, I can guarantee you 100%, not one promise of God will fail in your life. It might not come when you think it will. But I can guarantee you the Lord lays firm foundations. When you receive, you'll be able to steward it too. Don't rush God, but God will make every promise come to pass in your life. And we're out of time today. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless this word. Teach us this one thing to focus on our relationship with you, to walk out our purpose and to know in our heart that there's not anything that you won't make come to pass good in our life because you promised it. And you are faithful and we will persevere in our relationship with you. God, we love you. And we thank you in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Church, have a wonderful day.
I love you, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Have a great day.